Screen Design for Resource-Based Learning. In this short screencast I'm going to explain why you can use smaller normal text in PowerPoint when designing for the screen, why that text should be organized into narrow columns, the importance of background colors and the use of simple backgrounds, the need for navigation buttons to lead students through the package and some buttons you can use, the importance of giving students feedback on how far through the package they've got, and how to organize all these considerations in a paper-based planning process so you don't waste loads of time in PowerPoint. Why can text be smaller? Imagine you're in a room with a PowerPoint being projected on a screen. That screen probably occupies quite a small part of your visual field. If you're sitting at a monitor, the monitor occupies a much larger part of your visual field, so each object on the monitor screen looks bigger. For that reason, we can get away with a correspondingly smaller font size. I use 16 point and even 14 point for screen based presentations, whereas the templates built into PowerPoint use 36 and 24 point. Of course, they're designed for projection. Once you've got your text, you should really organize it into narrow columns. One reason for this can be illustrated by the following simulation. This is what one university website claims some students who are dyslexic see when they look at blocks of print. As you can see, there's a high resolution area in the center of that text, which is readable, and then the readability drops at either end of the line. Of course, the end of a line of text is very important because the eye then has to drop down exactly the right distance and fly back to the beginning of the next line. By using narrow columns of text, we can keep most of the text in the high definition area. Another reason for using narrow columns is to focus people's movement through your slides. This red trace here is the path that somebody's eye follows when they're looking at a website. Believe it or not, you can have a camera on the computer that tracks your eye movements as you're using that computer, and this is often used in usability research for websites. The person started looking at this web page on the top left hand side. They then rapidly scanned the whole web page looking for things to click. This is normal behavior for people looking at websites. We want to channel our students' uh, movement through the slide in the more effective way. So using narrow columns of text means that they won't be scanning all over the slide. Those columns of text should ideally appear in slow stages as they work their way through that slide. Here's a typical narrow column, slightly larger than print, and it's got slightly less characters per line than print, but maybe it'll be slightly more readable. Color contrast. Some combinations of colors have very low contrast. Try looking at this maybe a meter or two away from the screen. You'll see what I mean. Other combinations of color are very poor for people who are colorblind. The, set, the level of grey in this, these two colours is very similar, same for these two colours, so you just wouldn't see them if you were colourblind. Yellow on dark blue, or a dark background generally, has high contrast. The highest contrast, of course, is black on white, but that's a bit glary and maybe a little bit boring. Some students have a strong background colour preference. Some dyslexic students often use yellow, pale pink, blue or pale green backgrounds. If you have a student with a strong background preference in your group, obviously you use that colour for the background of your slides. If you have two students with different background preferences, it only takes a few seconds to change the background colours in PowerPoint, so it's quite feasible to produce separate copies for the two or more students. Many websites now have customization of colours, and this is a trend for the future. Backgrounds. To liven up a package, you might want to add backgrounds, but you have to keep the backgrounds away from the text. In this example, obviously, the black square makes the text almost unreadable, but the other squares aren't helping either. One workaround. Oh, it is possible to have plain text, but that's kind of boring. One workaround is to have a white background in just the text box, and the rest of the screen has the background that you desire. I quite often use photographs as backgrounds. If you can find a source of vocationally relevant photographs, this can establish an atmosphere within the package that supports the learning the students are trying to do. A good place to find copyright free photographs is yotophoto.com. This is a search engine dedicated to searching for copyright free images. It's wonderful. Navigation buttons. 
once you've got the content organized on the slides in a way that allows the student to read it, you've got to lead them into the next slide. PowerPoint contains some built-in buttons. They, they look like the old-fashioned keys on a cassette recorder. These two buttons mean previous and next. By convention, the one pointing right is next and the one pointing left is previous. In addition to these buttons, a home button might be quite useful. By convention, a home button, when you click on it, it leads you to the first slide in the package. That slide is usually a menu slide which allows you to access different sections of the package. Finally, another very useful kind of button is a help button. Wherever you are in the package, if you click on a help button, it will lead you to a standard help slide with basic information on how to use the package itself. That slide will have a back button, but the action attached to that back button will be previously viewed slide. So wherever you are in the package, it will jump you back to where you were. It's a wonderful slide to have, that one. You can use different icon sets for the buttons. There are many on the web, and some of them look very attractive indeed. However, having a standardised icon to represent each action, is, which is maintained through your package, is probably essential to reduce the amount of time students spend thinking about using the package and not about the learning you're trying to convey. Now the students are moving through your slides, it's important to tell them how far they've got and how far they've got to go. So one way of doing this is to have a simple little indicator in one part of the page that sort of gets longer or colours in as they move through the package. They're quite difficult to draw. A simpler technique is to simply have a slide that tells them every now and again when they've completed each major section. So you've now viewed six sections out of the seven sections in this screencast. The most important section is coming. Putting all this together, you want to design a standard layout for your content slides. Other slides may be different, menu slides and SAQ slides, but your content slides need to follow a standard pattern. Here's one example. As you can see, we've got a progress indicator, we've got text in columns, and we've got an area mapped out down the bottom for the navigation buttons. The three columns of text would appear progressively as students clicked on the bottom buttons on the columns of text, so that not all three columns would be visible straight away. Now, if we think about that eye scanning diagram I showed earlier, you can see that the progress indicator is in the wrong place. In my opinion, it's actually in the top of the screen and it's the best real estate on the whole slide. Another issue with this slide is the way that the content, which I've now isolated between those two green bars, is only occupying about 60 to 50 percent of the area of the slide. The rest of the slide is navigation and progress indicator. A workaround for that is to move the progress indicator down to the navigation area or maybe do away with it and simply give message slides every now and again and then move the content up to the top of the slide so you've got far more space for text. I could get another you know 50 words on that slide quite easily. So the message here is to plan something then criticize it and that leads us to a cycle. Plan on paper, use the screen template to plan, try alternative layouts, replan, maybe swap with somebody else before you go anywhere near PowerPoint. If you get 50 slides done in PowerPoint and then suddenly realize you have to replan the entire appearance of your slide, it is incredibly painful. In summary, if you use small text organized into columns with a sensible choice of colors, an attractive and interesting background, but with plain colors behind your text. If you then organize your buttons to lead students through the package, and if you tell them how far through they are of, on the package, the result will be happy students who are spending more time on your learning and less time on what we often call learning junk or cognitive load, you know, working out what to do next with the package. Now, as you might imagine, this little piece of learning will end up with a question to a test attainment. Throughout this video, you'll have noticed that certain slides are black with a typewriter font, and other slides have a white background. Why, what's special about the black slides with a typewriter font? Just use the little drag bar to go back through the video and see. And what function do you think is uh, carried out by having those slides in a distinguishable colour? That's the end of this screencast.